I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, Israel and Iran. Tensions are rising in the Middle East as the world seeks a solution. Working over the weekend, lawmakers on Capitol Hill are moving closer to a vote on a foreign aid package, praying for peace. The Holy Father's message to a group of children at the Vatican. And remembering Pope Benedict, a report from Rome on the anniversary of the election of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger to the papacy. These stories add more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, the Biden administration makes clear the United States was not involved in Israel's offensive operations against Iran. Secretary of State Antony Blinken addressed the conflict today after meeting with allies in Italy. EWTN correspondent Tara Mergener reports. Tara? Well, Tracy, it seems the White House is trying to distance itself from these latest attacks in the Middle East. Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre started the briefing today by saying, quote, she did not want to speak or speculate about any of these reports. Video shows the scene in Iran after Israel launched airstrikes against it. The latest tensions drawing an immediate response from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Already overseas in Italy, Blinken met with U.S. allies and G7 counterparts. What we're focused on, what the G7 is focused on, and again it's reflected in our statement and in our conversation, is our work to de-escalate. Uh, tensions. The White House is echoing the response after already issuing new sanctions against Iran earlier this week. We do not want to see uh, this conflict uh, escalate. We continue to consult with our allies and partners, including, uh, including in the region, obviously, and to reduce further risk of escalation in the region. The U.S. continues to say it is committed to helping Israel defend itself. The Jewish state remains locked in a battle with the Hamas terrorists that attacked on October 7th. The only thing, the only thing standing between the Gazan people and a ceasefire is Hamas. It's rejected generous proposals from Israel. It seems more interested in a regional conflict than it is in a ceasefire that would immediately improve the lives of the Palestinian people. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan also responding to the war in the Middle East. He met with the Israelis as part of a strategic consultative group. The two sides discussed Rafa, where many Palestinian people are seeking refuge. The White House writing, the two sides agreed on the shared objective to see Hamas defeated in Rafa. U.S. participants expressed concerns with various courses of action in Rafa, and Israeli participants agreed to take these concerns into account. And President Biden did not talk about the war during his speech to union workers this afternoon here in D.C. He did focus on his economic agenda, including jobs, taxes, and investments. At the White House, I'm Tara Mergener, EWTN News Nightly. All right, here with more of the situation in central Iran is Stephen Cook, Senior Fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies at the Council on foreign relations. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. I, I want to begin here at home right now. The White House has really been pretty quiet in the wake of these strikes. Why do you think that is? Well, I, the president had said that he did not support uh, in Israeli retaliation in the wake of Iran's attack on Israel. That's uh, certainly not a green light, but it's also not a red light. Um, and so, he was essentially telling the Israelis that they are on their own, and the Israelis uh, took that as <laughs> in the case and and uh, retaliated against Iran. I, I think that the the president wants to focus uh, attention on his economic message rather than the very controversial conflict that is unfolding across the Middle East. Yeah, and that retaliation was really actually kind of a small strike uh, with limited damage done. Now, if that's the case, why do you think Israel risks provoking Iran even more without taking more significant action, that is? What do you think Israel's strategy is here, and what was the purpose? I think the purpose was to demonstrate to the Iranians that, unlike the Iranians, the Israelis can penetrate Iranians, Iran's air defenses with impunity and uh, strike at targets at will. Um, this was a message that um, what of what the Israeli capability is. 
and that should there be another another attack on Israel, the Israelis could easily widen uh, widen and intensify its strikes on Iran. Um, I think the Israelis demonstrated the limited capabilities of the Iranians last night, and that was very much their intention, while not provoking an immediate response. Yeah, and Stephen, reports out of Iran say the country isn't planning to retaliate. Your thoughts? I mean, should we take those statements at face value? I, I don't think we should. Um, the Iranian, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which essentially controls Iran, um, is very, very hard line um, on these issues, particularly when it comes to to Israel. And uh, we have said over and over again in the West that neither Iran nor uh, Israel wants escalation, yet there has been continuous escalation since October 7th. So I don't think that we should um, sit back and say this is over. Um, the Iranians may come back uh, in some time and undertake some sort of action against the Israelis. The Israelis may see an opportunity, yet another opportunity to uh, hit at um, Iranian proxy forces in Syria or Iraq. Um, there's all kinds of a whole range of actions each country can take against each other. Um, they're clearly um, two countries that um, are spoiling for a fight. So I would not necessarily say that this is over. Yeah, we have about 30 seconds left or so. But quickly, I mean, how does this escalating violence uh, between Israel and Iran, how do you think it impacts ceasefire negotiations and what happens from here? I don't think that they're really uh, linked. Uh, I think the problem with uh, the ceasefire negotiations is that Hamas is unwilling to give up its one bargaining chip, and those are Israeli hostages. Okay, we're going to leave it right there. Stephen Cook from the Council on Foreign Relations, thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Well, after several days of internal House GOP infighting, the $95 billion foreign aid package is a step closer to getting a final vote. Today, the full House passed the rules for the package, which will send billions to Israel, Ukraine, and the Indo-Pacific, setting up a rare Saturday vote. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the very latest. Good evening, Trace. You know, there's really two stories making headlines out of the U.S. House right now. First, the foreign aid bill. It did pass the rules vote with more Democrats actually voting for it than Republicans. A final vote is expected tomorrow. Then the other story you have, that because the package is now headed for a final vote, it could be the beginning of the end for House Speaker Mike Johnson. We expect a motion to make it soon. I'm not answering questions right now. A defiant Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene left the chamber in a haste, but earlier this week she warned. The Republican speaker is hinging his entire um, uh, ability to stay speaker on sending 60 more billion dollars to Ukraine. I can't think of a, a worse betrayal ever to happen in, in United States history. Now her effort to oust the speaker is gaining momentum. Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar is throwing his support behind Greene and Thomas Massey. He posted on next quote, we need a speaker who puts America first rather than bending to the reckless demands of the warmongers, neocons, and military industrial complex making billions from a costly and endless war half a world away. We need disruptors in Congress. We don't need disruptors. So the vast majority of my Republican colleagues are over this drama, okay? This is not supposed to be re reality television. We came here to govern. Other Republicans tell me that's not the answer. I do not support a motion to vacate, and as disappointed as I am in the speaker and disagree with his handling of this particular uh, issue in legislation, um, I do not support the motion to vacate. I don't see how the conference, the Congress, or the country gains from that. Right now, Democratic leadership say it's only concentrating on passing the foreign aid package and won't say if they will come to the aid of Johnson. We've been waiting for months, unnecessarily because of gamesmanship and partisanship and brinksmanship on the other side of the aisle. Your concern is all this mess is going to end up causing Republicans the House. I think that, that when the American people gave us the gavel, they were begging for leadership. They were begging for it. We had the leadership, right? And look at how we've done. How have we done? All Speaker Johnson is saying right now is that he will continue to govern. Meanwhile, Congressman Green and others could bring a motion to vacate soon, so the fireworks may continue tomorrow. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, a chaotic day in the courtroom for former President Donald Trump. Shortly after all 12 jurors and six alternates were seated in the former president's hush money trial, things took a turn for the worse when a man set himself on fire just outside the court. 
when he's in the park, he starts shuffling around his clothes. He opens up a book bag. From the book bag, he takes numerous pieces of papers, uh, pamphlets out. He throws the pamphlets throughout the park, and then he pulls out a canister and pours some kind of liquid on himself, a liquid we believe is an accelerant, and he lights himself on fire. Uh, police say the man was rushed to the hospital and is now in critical condition. As mentioned, the stage is now set for opening arguments in the case to begin next week. The judge says lawyers will present opening statements Monday before prosecutors begin laying out their case. The former president returned to the courtroom following jury selection for a Sandoval hearing to determine if prosecutors can bring up any prior alleged bad acts by Trump if he chooses to testify. Our president Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump will battle it out at the ballot box in Pennsylvania in just a few days as voters head to the polls on Tuesday for the Commonwealth's primary. Both candidates made campaign stops in the Keystone State in recent days, with Trump swinging by Bucks and Lehigh counties and President Biden making a three-day push through PA with stops in Scranton, Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh. And here now to talk more about that and the key role Pennsylvania is playing in this year's presidential race is Brandon McGinley, editorial page editor for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Brandon, good to be with you today. We appreciate it. Uh, according to the Cook Political Report, Pennsylvania is one of six toss-up states in the 2024 election. And in 2020, Biden, as you know, won PA. And in 2016, Trump turned the state red, pulling off a win against Hillary Clinton. Uh, Brandon, and so let's talk about what a win in Pennsylvania means for the candidates and how crucial is it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think Pennsylvania is absolutely a must win state for, for Joe Biden in particular. Uh, it's really difficult to see a path to victory for him if he were to lose it, as he did in 2016. Yeah. And what are some of the big issues uh, for voters in Pennsylvania right now? What are you hearing and seeing? Well, I think one of the things that makes Pennsylvania distinctive is precisely that it's not very distinctive. It is very similar to the rest of the country, demographically, uh, socioeconomically, and in its diversity. <clears throat> and so, um, and so, I think what you see here are some of the same things you see elsewhere. Um, I look around Pittsburgh, a place that's known for having relatively low cost of living, and I see concerns about cost of living, especially on housing. Um, and so, things like that that maybe are difficult to track with uh, with economic data that people do see on a day-to-day -day basis, especially again in an area where we're used to being known as a low cost of living area and it doesn't feel like that anymore. Yeah, that's really scary right there. And while in Pittsburgh, uh, President Biden, uh, he made a speech at the United Steelworkers headquarters, this on the heels of the announced acquisition of U.S. Steel by Japan-based Nippon Steel. Talk to us a little bit more about what Biden had to say and what type of impact do you think it had? How do you think it resonated with folks? Yeah, it's clear that politicians, frankly, across the aisle think that it's good politics to attack the acquisition of U.S. Steel by Nippon Steel. I will say just from my perspective and from the experts I've spoken with, I have yet to find a nonpartisan expert who is who thinks that it's a bad deal for American workers or for America, the American economy. But it's clear that and this is actually one way I think that Donald Trump has really shifted the uh, the entire what's considered normal in American politics is this kind of economic populism or nationalism is in now, and both parties are trying to get in on it. And one of the ways they do that is by attacking uh, this acquisition. Yeah, and, and President Biden, as you know, he often, you know, touts his humble Pennsylvania roots from Scranton. I I'm curious about this. You know, how do you think that's going to play into this election and also, Brandon, the upcoming primary on Tuesday? How much of a difference does that make for voters in PA? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think that in some ways, you know, some some of that has kind of played out, uh, you know, with it's already baked in. I guess you might 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 be fair to say. I am curious to see how. Speaking of the primary, the 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 only thing that we've terribly interesting in the primary is how far the uncommitted movement gets. Um, around here, you do see some some um, some momentum for voting uncommitted in the Democratic primary. I think the vast majority of them will will return to Biden in the general, but uh, it will be interesting to see if that generates uh, any any chatter in the coming days and weeks. Yeah, and Brandon, Pennsylvania, as we know, is a very big state. I'm from there originally, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, very different. In between, any sense, though, of how folks may vote in this upcoming election? Well, uh, you know, it, it, let me put it this way. If we are in October 
and we think that Pennsylvania is on the knife's edge, I think that's bad news for Joe Biden. I think Biden needs to have a comfortable two or three point lead here going into election night, because if not, uh, it'll hard to, hard to see how some other states will come online for him. Um, one th local thing that may be of interest is that the local Democratic Party in Pittsburgh has recently been taken over by folks who are definitely more on the left. And there's definitely been some concerns about the state of Pittsburgh, especially downtown Pittsburgh among suburban Pittsburghers. Um, and so that could be a, a slight headwind for Joe Biden and seeing uh, concerns about democratic governance among more moderate suburbanites in the Pittsburgh area. All right, Brandon, thank you so much for weighing in. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including consolidation plans, a report from Ireland on the plans to reduce the number of dioceses in the Emerald Isle. And we'll tell you where the world's largest election is now taking place. Welcome back. A recent article examined the state of the Catholic Church in Ireland, noting that many of the 26 dioceses established as far back as the 12th century are now being merged. Writing in the Irish Times, Patsy McGarry said in part, quote, driven by a declining number of clergy, declining attendances at masses and other liturgies, an increase in civil marriages and declining income, generally necessity has become the mother of invention where a restructuring of Catholic Ireland is concerned. And the author of that piece, Patsy McGarry, joins us now from Ireland. Patsy, great to be with you today. So for those who may not be aware, tell us a little bit more about the current state of the Catholic Church in Ireland. Uh, I understand your article notes, for instance, that there are only 21 bishops for 26 dioceses. Yeah, well, in the Catholic world, that's quite a lot for a small population. Uh, approximately uh, on, on the whole island of Ireland, we have about four and a half million Catholics. Uh, we have 26 dioceses, now, which go back over a thousand years to 1111, actually, to a synod that took place that year, followed up by another one in 1152, which consolidated what we have today as there were, were 36 dioceses. There are now uh, 26 in the Catholic world. And uh, you look at the biggest diocese in the United States, which is the um, Archdiocese of Los Angeles. It is about slightly over 4 million Catholics, yet it has one cardinal archbishop and six auxiliary bishops. We currently in Ireland have 21 bishops in diocese and three auxiliary bishops, which is quite a lot for a small uh, country uh, and for a, a comparatively small Catholic church in terms of overall population. Yeah, and Patsy, um, how are the faithful and church leaders, how are they responding to the restructuring, are they concerned? Uh, I mean, the, the Catholic bishops themselves have been concerned for some time about the decline of vocations overall, uh, and uh, this is one of their measures they're adopting to uh, deal with that. I mean, there will be more. I mean, in the West of Ireland, we've had uh, there were six dioceses which would be reduced to three. Now, it is the least populous part of Ireland with just over 460,000 Catholics compared to 1.1 million in the Dublin Archdiocese alone. Most Catholics in Ireland, like most of the population, is on the east coast of the island. Patsy, do you see any signs that maybe things are improving uh, on that end? Any sign of hope for the Catholic Church and maybe sort of a revival in these numbers? Well, uh, I, uh, what's happening is a reversion in practice to uh, patterns uh, before the famine period in Ireland, when there were very, very few priests, for instance, because they were persecuted by the administration of the time. They weren't allowed to say masses, etc. Catholics weren't allowed to practice under the penal laws. They weren't allowed an education. They weren't allowed to join the professions. They were a heavily uh, persecuted majority, because the majority of people on this island at the time were Catholic. Ten percent were not. Uh, but the 10% had control under the British government at the time. Uh, Catholics were, were heavily persecuted at that time. So before the famine period for Catholic emancipation in 1829, there were a few priests, but people practiced in the home. Um, most um, sacraments were prepared for in the home. Uh, funerals took place out of the home, involving mainly lay people. There would be re irregular masses because priests weren't regularly available, and there was, these masses would take place often out in the open, penal rocks, etc. Uh, and we are going back, to, we're not going back to penal rocks, but we're going back to that level of irregular practice, uh, and with more emphasis, if you like, on a personal faith. 
people, old traditional pilgrimages are being revived, uh, patterns that were called, named after the patron saint of a locality, all those things which were changed and got rid of um, after the famine in a new form of Catholicism in Ireland are being revived. Uh, as well as that, there's a newer type of bishop being appointed. He's a, they tend to be more pro progressive, much closer to the people, to use the phrase of Pope Francis, they smell of the sheep, uh, they're less authoritarian, uh, they're more consultative, they're more synodal, if you like, where the people are concerned. And that is improving things generally where the church is concerned, but it has a long, long road back. Well, Patsy McGarry of the Irish Times, thank you so much for your time and your insights. We appreciate it. God bless. You're very welcome, Tracy. Bye-bye. Well, it is the world's largest election, and it is seen as one of India's most consequential. Hours before voting began at 7 a.m., millions had lined up outside of polling stations in the scorching heat. The election is staggered over the next six weeks. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is expected to win a rare third consecutive term. Under his leadership, the country has become the fastest growing major economy and modern global power. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, headed back to court. New developments for a Christian lawmaker in Finland who has been acquitted twice of hate speech. Plus, a look back at the papacy of Pope Benedict XVI on the anniversary of his election. member of parliament in Finland will stand trial for a third time in a case involving her social media post quoting a Bible verse. Pavi Rasanen is set to face trial before the country's Supreme Court for expressing her Christian beliefs on marriage and sexuality on X, formerly known as Twitter. Two lower courts acquitted Rasanen of so-called hate speech charges. No date has been set for the Supreme Court to hear the case. Well, finally tonight, 19 years ago today, German-born Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was elected Pope. He was the 266th successor to St. Peter. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser has more. Cari fratelli e sorelle. Dear brothers and sisters, after the great Pope John Paul II, the cardinals have elected me, a simple and humble laborer, in the vineyard of the Lord. It was Tuesday, April the 19th, 2005, when Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was elected Pope on the second day of the conclave on the fourth ballot. E sorelle carissimi. Appearing on the balcony of the Basilica, Cardinal Protodeacon Jorge Medina Estevez announced the election. The fact that the Lord knows how to work and to act even with inadequate instruments comforts me. And above all, I entrust myself to your prayers. Let us move forward in the joy of the risen Lord, confident of his unfailing help. The Lord will help us, and Mary, his most holy mother, will be on our side. Thank you. Grazie. During the conclave, Cardinal Ratzinger's undisputed moral and intellectual authority was recognized, as well as his continuity with Pope John Paul II's pontificate. Also noteworthy was Cardinal Ratzinger's deft handling as Dean of the College of Cardinals of both John Paul II's funeral and the general congregations preparing the conclave. The seventh German-speaking pontiff in history chose the name Benedict XVI, inspired by Pope Benedict XV, who led the church through the turmoil of the First World War. The pontificate of Benedict XVI lasted nearly eight years. On February the 11th, 2013, the Pope announced his resignation from the Petrine ministry, thus calling for the convocation of a conclave for the election of his successor. The announcement was made by the Pope in Latin during the consistory for the canonization of the martyrs of Otranto and three other blessed. The last pope to resign was Pope Gregory XII in 1415. Benedict left the Vatican on February 28 to retire to the pontifical villas of Castel Gandolfo, assuming the title of Pope Emeritus. 
Three months later, he returned to the Vatican to live in the Mater Ecclesia monastery, a place Pope Francis frequently visited to greet his predecessor, especially after the creation of new cardinals. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI passed away on December 31, 2022, at the age of 95. A few days later, on January the 5th, Pope Francis presided over the funeral in St. Peter's Square. It was attended by over 50,000 faithful from around the world who had come to pay their respects to Benedict XVI. In Rome, Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN News Nightly. Well, before we say goodbye, we want to say happy birthday to our foundress, Mother Angelica, who celebrates her 101st birthday tomorrow in heaven. Happy birthday, Mother, and we thank you for the gift of EWTN, and we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night, and God bless.